Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Welcome back, everyone. Glad to have you with me here today on our Wellness and Weight Loss Wednesday edition of the Cabral Concept. Today's episode is number 2651. If you'd like to follow along with these show notes and get the three big takeaways from this show, head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 2651. All right, we're going to dive right into the show today. It is based on why low-carb diets may cause burnout or adrenal fatigue in certain individuals. This is extremely important. I've been talking about this for many, many years based on the popularity uh, of the keto diet, based on the popularity of the growing carnivore diet, and many others. So I was listening to, uh, it was a a clip. I don't get a chance to listen to a lot of two- and three-hour podcasts. I I wish I I wish I I had that time sometimes, Um, but I like to listen to some clips here and there to see what's going on in the world and what people are talking about. And I think Andrew Huberman uh, is a really intelligent neuroscientist. I enjoy his work. I think he's, again, like I said, super smart. He said something, though, and it's very interesting, and I don't like to take people out of context because I think uh, Dr. Huberman is a very, very smart individual and researcher and scientist. Um, But he was talking about the potential benefits of a low-carb diet on increasing energy. And I thought it was very interesting. And he knew he knew why, and he gave the reason. This is what he said. He said, one of the reasons why people feel sometimes more energy on a low-carb diet is because a low-carb diet increases norepinephrine and adrenaline. And I said, that is absolutely correct. And there's a funny thing, though, Because when you say something does something like increased norepinephrine and adrenaline, then you also have to say, but then it could also affect these people negatively. And it was looked at, and again, Dr. Huberman can't give every contraindication on a podcast. You know, neither can I, neither can any of my colleagues. So what I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about Andrew, is that, is this. There are many people who are doing low-carb diets but are already stressed, are already fatigued, are already moving towards burnout, already have lower levels of thyroid, and you put them on a low-carb diet or keto diet or carnivore diet, and initially they may feel incredible. They have less fermentable-based food in their gut. They might feel less bloating less cramping, so now they have less inflammation there. They might feel less joint pain because, again, they have an imbalanced microbiome. I've talked about that on previous shows, so I'm not going to go into that here today. And um, oftentimes, they're eating less calories in general. So we look at that and we say, that's fantastic. You know, like, that's great. But what we don't talk about is this. And Ayurveda has talked about this for thousands of years, and so I really want to give Ayurvedic medicine its due in this show. You have to understand is that when you take carbohydrates out of a person's diet, we're talking low carbohydrate diet. So typically it's sub 50 grams of carbs per day. But again, that can be, it's all bio-individual based. Imagine an athlete and they're burning, you know, thousands and thousands of calories per day. Well, for them, you know, 50 grams would be nothing, right? For them, even sub 100 grams of carbs per day might be a low calorie diet, depending on how many depending on how many calories they eat in a given day, right? So if you think about it, if someone's eating 4,000 calories a day and they get 100 grams of carbs, uh, that's only 400 calories, so it's only 10% of their diet. That's a, that's considered a low-carb diet, right? So you always think of, like, who's the individual? But for your average individual, sub-50 grams is low, sub-25 grams is basically then moving towards no-carb, low-carb, keto-based diet. So anyway, let me get back to the topic on hand. So... When we're talking about this, what we're saying is that this individual now is missing a macro group. And I'm going to do a follow-up show next week, so please do stay tuned next week on the Cabral Concept because I'm going to be talking about how a low-carb diet also affects 
mind, mood, and neurotransmitter production. So I won't get deep into that here today. But suffice to say, the body is missing its main energy source. Now, there's debate that people don't need carbohydrates in general. And you can, yeah, you can absolutely get away with not eating any carbohydrates. Uh, in my practice, we talk about optimal. We don't talk about like how to manipulate the body and get away with something. Like, because I'm gonna talk about this in just a moment. You pay for it. You are going to pay for it. You're creating that debt, right? So low-carb diets may create and do create energy debts. And that is extremely important to understand because here's why. When you produce greater amounts of cortisol, and I will link up the research studies for anyone who would like to see them, and they're very straightforward, you can go to stephencabral.com slash 2651. And before I go on to explain exactly why, I just want you to know we use low carbohydrate diets in my practice as well. So I wanna share that with you. Again, there's a time and place for everything. So we use them for about three weeks maximum before we start to gradually increase carbohydrates. And it works really effectively. Now let's talk about why we do this in clinical practice and not just like, again, create a marketing scheme that people do online. It's because of this. When you increase cortisol levels, and you, you before that you would have increased norepinephrine and, and adrenaline, like Dr. Huberman said, and then if there are not and is not enough glucose or blood high enough blood sugar levels, the body will tell the adrenals, adrenal cortex, to produce cortisol or glucocorticoid. And its main job is actually to get a fast fuel source because fat is not gonna be oxidized fast enough. Oxygen is not gonna be efficient enough. So it's getting glucose for the body and the brain. And you don't get to choose. So a lot of people say, no, I'm fat adapted. I get it, it's a nice term, I like it as well. The problem is this, when you are in fight or flight, you don't get to choose, right? If you spike adrenaline and norepinephrine and your blood sugar levels are not high enough, you're, there is a positive and negative feedback loop. And the negative feedback loop will tell the body to produce as much cortisol as needed in order to respond to the stress. The greater the stress, the greater the adrenal response. If the HPA axis, that means the hypothalamus, pituitary adrenal axis is working well enough in order to produce that glucocorticoid cortisol. When I had Addison's disease, I was not producing enough cortisol, right? And that left me with highs and lows and blood sugar and all sorts of brain fog and fatigue and joint pain. It was absolutely miserable. So I'm very happy that I was able to overcome that because it's not a good place to be. You feel like you have the flu all the time. But what I want to share with you is this. When you get that call of cortisol, you are using your glycogen stores, if, they're, if your liver is all out of stored sugar, you will start to break down muscle tissue as well. It will create a deficit or a weakening of your metabolism, and it will begin to use up many of the minerals in your body, many of those that help to stop and calm sympathetic nervous system dominance or fight or flight, namely magnesium and some of that potassium. But it can also throw off sodium and potassium levels. We won't get too deep on that here today. But what happens is when adrenal stress is high enough, that just means norepinephrine and cortisol are high, your body has other hormones it produces like aldosterone that start to hold on to sodium preferentially. It's used, it's needed for this fight or flight based response. What does all of this mean? Again, because I'm gonna try to simplify this, is that this stress on your body will slow your metabolism over time, may affect your sleep, may affect your blood sugar, may affect your immune system, and will most certainly, especially in, in women, affect your thyroid. So now, we see in clinical practice, after about three, four weeks, typically four to six weeks, that's why we stop it at three, is that the thyroid can, be go, can start to go lower. And what does that mean? Well, you get a raise on your thyroid stimulating hormone, your TSH. Now, you might think like, oh, a higher number means stronger thyroid. It actually doesn't. It means your brain is telling your thyroid to produce more hormone because, the thyroid stimulating hormone, because you have lower levels of thyroid. So it's saying produce this thing called thyroid stimulating hormone because your free thyroid, your free T3 or free T4, is on the lower end because it is being blunted by the effects of stress. The first part, which is, I won't go too deep into it, I know I've been throwing around a lot of terms here today, but your hypothalamus and your pituitary produce 
their own hormones, like adrenal corticotropin hormone, that actually tells the adrenals what to do. When that is being produced, it starts to block the thyroid from producing T4 and then converting to T3. And if it does, it actually converts it to what's called reverse T3, not all of it. Reverse T3 is then unusable thyroid hormone. So now you end up with a drier skin, poor circulation, cold hands and feet, poor sleep, higher cholesterol, thinning of the hair, thinning of the eyebrow, brain fog, and that's low thyroid. And unfortunately, it, it strikes about one out of five women and one out of eight men. So is it everyone? No, but it's a whole lot of people. When you have you know, 300 million people in the United States or more than that, well, I mean, how many people is it affecting? Uh, 50 million to 100, yeah, right around 50 million people to, no, 60, 60 million people, right? That's a serious number. So my recommendation is this. Low-carb diets do work. They work better on a cyclical basis. They work better with a plan. You're going low-carb, you're gaining the benefits, but then you're working on the true underlying root cause of your gut issues, your joint pain, your inflammation, your weight gain, whatever it might be. And so I want to relate this, though, just towards the end, because Ayurveda has taught us this for many years. And so when I was learning uh, in my studies and from my mentor about Ayurvedic medicine, and I was studying overseas as well in India and in Sri Lanka, is I realized that there are people who do better on a lower carbohydrate diet. Now, extremely low, no. The body type that does the best with it is the kapha body type. The kapha body type, and I can link up my Ayurvedic shows, and I'll do that at episode 2651, is typically prone to lower fight or flight response, lower norepinephrine, lower adrenaline, and sometimes lower cortisol production. So, going slightly lower carb, or even for them having a cup of coffee in the morning, or for them to do an intermittent fast of 12, 14, 16 hours could be more beneficial. Why? They're generally producing less of that stimulating hormone. Now we have to be careful because the kapha body type can also have lower thyroid, which is why for me, anyone that I'm working with with weight loss, I guess that one of their primary goals, we're stopping eating the earlier the better at night, four, five, 6 p.m. at the latest. And then we're still getting a 12, 14, 16 hour intermittent fast, but we're typically not fasting past eight or 10 in the morning. So you can still get three meals in, we can still take care of the thyroid, the hormones, stress production, and then next week I'm gonna teach you about the neurotransmitters for the mind and the brain uh, and the emotions. So that's that's very beneficial. And that, that body type, although I have them on a certain amount of carbohydrates, I don't have them on low carb and I don't have them on high carb. Typically their sweet spot is somewhere between 50 and 100. I can't give you the exact amount, it's all based on the individual, right? Okay, now, Let's look at the other end of the spectrum. It would be the vata body type or the ectomorph, whereas the kapha is the endomorph in conventional-based psychology and medicine. The vata is more of the ectomorph. And we can add in a little bit of that pitta or what's called the mesomorph. If you typically run a little bit more anxious, a little bit more stressed, a little bit thinner, lose weight more easily, thinner joints, like all of these different things, you're prone more to weight loss than you are weight gain if you just kind of followed your normal routine. This body type does really poorly with low carb diets in the long run. Can anyone feel better in the short term? Yes, in the long run, can it lead to burnout or energy debt? Yeah, absolutely it does, 100%, why? Their bodies are not as robust. They don't have as many reserves. They don't have as much muscle mass. If they were to break down muscle mass, it's that much more detrimental. They're more prone to osteoporosis. Like it's, they're more prone to producing higher levels of stress hormone. So now you put them on a low carb diet and you've asked their body now to produce more stress hormone to compensate for a missing carbohydrate in the easiest fuel that you can put in your body for energy as well as to calm the central nervous system as well as to promote the happy, feel-good neurotransmitters, how to boost GABA levels. You boost GABA levels by adding carbohydrates to your diet. That's one way, easy way to do it. Sleep is helpful, meditation is helpful, but so are carbohydrates. Now, am I telling you to go overboard? No, I'm saying everybody eats the right amount of carbohydrates for their body. The Vata body type, though, 
Certainly, their highest percentage of macros is coming from carbohydrates, and they do really well this way, and they maintain a balanced nervous system, which is one of the most important things for this particular body type, uh, and what's called dosha in Ayurvedic medicine. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a, a taste for that today. I know there'll probably be follow-up questions. Do feel free to leave them below. Happy to help with that. I'll also link up my Ayurvedic podcast at stephencabral.com forward slash 2651. There are probably 50 plus shows just on Ayurveda. Happy to bring that to you. Um, Again, I just want to say, uh, again, appreciate everyone in this field of natural health, all the natural health practitioners. Dr. Andrew Huberman's amazing and uh, wanted to also give him a shout out for uh, getting the gears turning in my mind, how I can also share the other side to what he shared on a podcast he was on. So thank you all. I appreciate you and have an amazing day. Feel free to share this show with anyone you believe it could serve. Did you know that the body really only becomes sick or unbalanced in only two ways? Over time, you become deficient in vital nutrients and you also accumulate toxins internally and from the environment. As those nutrients diminish and you increase your total toxic load, your body then begins to show the first signs of dis-ease. It's actually quite predictable and the good news is that if we know how you began to fill up that proverbial rain barrel, We also know how to empty it to begin the healing process. I was fortunate enough to learn this ancient healing process from my mentor after suffering from debilitating diseases for close to a decade. It was only when I began to implement these techniques did I finally overcome my illnesses and go on to live a life of energy and vitality that I now enjoy. I'd like to share with you now what I discovered after traveling all over the world and how to combine the best of ancient healing wisdom with state-of-the-art science. Allow me to teach you exactly how I've been able to help over a quarter of a million people to empty their rain barrel and begin to transform their body and lives into what they've always hoped they could be. To get your copy of the international bestseller, The Rain Barrel Effect, simply go to stephencabral.com forward slash rain barrel.